Let's uh, all stand and sing. Blessed be your name.
All may be seated. Good morning to everybody. And a special welcome for the visitors who are among us. We hope you feel at home. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You give and take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Um, we have to start to um, do condolences um, to the family of Giglia, whose nephew, Zian, uh, died in a motor accident um, this week. And also to the family of Joanna, um, Mr. Otten, who died and um, leaving behind his wife and two children. And when I was preparing for this morning, I, I was thinking, how has been your week? How was past week? And if I could hear everyone's story, we should hear all different stories today. And some had a very blessed week, some were in vacation, some enjoyed this week, some were in difficulty. And you know, how things can go, it's always our connection with Jesus that makes the difference. That things are going well in your life, that things are going difficultly in your life. All the difference is in our relation with Jesus. Because he supports, he comforts, he gives wisdom, he gives strength, he gives peace in our hearts. And um, I like to start with the with psalm, Psalm 34, if you will open your Bibles to read it with me. I read it from the NIV. And it's such a comforting psalm. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name all together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the road encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge with him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves him and loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your, thing, your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good, seek peace, and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cries out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. 
evil will slay the wicked, the foes of the righteous will be condemned. But the Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Father, we thank you so much for these words of encouragement, Father. We can, we can witness about your faith and your strength and your love and your patience and your many, many blessings in our lives. Father, thank you so much that we may gather in fellowship with you, with one another. We pray, Father, that we may be connected in our hearts and in our mind with you this morning hear your words worship you father we will be with you and we will go from here after service father built up and changed in our hearts thank you so much father for your presence in the lives of each of us in jesus name amen amen thank you Let's sing together, Be Thou My Vision.
the children come up? Children, waiting for you. <laughs> The sun has come out a little bit. Praise the Lord. Any more children? I see some in the back. Yeah, good. Good morning. Wow, you look nice. It's kind of chilly, right? We'll keep our eyes on the sunshine. <laughs> so today I have brought something which is in my hand that I want to show to you. And I wonder if you could take a wild guess and say what you think it might be. What could it be? Actually, I'll put it in this hand. I think it would. A heart, no, kind of far from that. Well, I don't think you could probably ever guess what this is because it's not an easy answer. This is what it is. Do you know what that is? So anybody who knows anything about avocados knows that this is an avocado seed. This is an avocado. And I don't know about your family, we love to eat guacamole. So you take the insides and squish it up and make a dip into it. It's so delicious. So avocado seeds are really pretty big. But there's another seed that I want to talk to you about. It's not big like the avocado seed, but it is very tiny. It's called a mustard seed. And I thought so that you would understand better that I would draw a picture of the mustard seed and it took me a long time to draw this picture. <laughs> so I want to show it to you. Here it is. Are you ready? Yes. Are you really ready? Yeah. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. This is the, this is the mustard seed. This is my picture <laughs> of the mustard seed. <laughs> took me all night to draw that. Okay, it's very tiny. And we know that Jesus used the mustard seed to give an example of what it means to have faith. Okay? And he said in Luke chapter 17, it says here that the apostles, his followers, said to the Lord, increase our faith make it more and the Lord replied if you had faith the size of a mustard seed you could say to this tree be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you that's pretty amazing isn't it just the size of a mustard seed okay now what Jesus was, was trying to say, not that they should pray and see how many trees could be moved into the sea, but that he meant that even if they had a little speck of solid faith, God could do great things through them. For example, if they cho chose to love certain people who were usually very mean and critical, those people might want to follow Jesus too. They might feel such love after a period of time that they also want to follow Jesus. Or maybe it would mean for us to go forward and to ask someone to come to church with us. 
And that person might say yes. And it may be the first time they've ever gone to church. Or maybe he wants to say, if you have a speck like a mustard seed grain of faith, and you have an idea that you want to do something, like a little vision of something you want to do, talk to me about it, and I can open things up for you. And I would like to give you an example of somebody who did this, who was in our church many years ago. Her name was Marcia. And Mrs. Marcia loved kids. Way back in 1982, which is really far back, nearly 40 years ago, she heard about vacation Bible school in America because she was an American. And she thought, wow, I would really like to see this happen where we are at IBC. So at that time, our church was not here. It was in Wallaway St. Pierre. It was a lot smaller. But she just had a vision to do this. And what did she do? She began to pray about it, okay, and talk to the Lord about it. And the more she did that, the more energy she got. And people began, she began seeing and praying for different people who could get involved. And before long, they had a whole team of people involved. But in those days, all of the teachers with the separate age groups had to write their own lessons, bring their own crafts, and make their own refreshments for each group. So it was kind of complicated. So we really have it easier today, even though it's still a bit complicated. But you know what? Ever since that VBS in 1982 got started, there have been hundreds and hundreds of children who have come to vacation Bible school in the summertime. In fact, families have planned their vacation time around when VBS is. It only took a mustard seed grain of faith for Miss Marcia, and God showed his great favor in the way things grew. In fact, you could say that that little seed over years and years became like the mustard tree. You see how huge that tree is? This must have been taken in Africa because there's some animals below that I think, I think they're antelope, but I'm not really sure. They're really beautiful, but the size of the tree is huge. And that's what God can do with a mustard seed grain of faith. Okay? So there's three things that I think are sure about what it means to have faith the size of a mustard seed. The first thing is, though, before we think of that, just like the song talked about this morning, we want to ask the Lord to help us to have clean hearts, pure hearts, because we can't really pray for anything and have a big faith if there's sin in our lives. So we want to be sure that we have pure hearts. And the second thing is, a mustard seed is really tiny, but it is solid. Okay, and a tiny bit of solid faith can bring big blessings that we would never imagine. And the final thing is a person needs to have unselfish prayers when they have a mustard seed grain of faith. Not asking just for God to bless them, but to bless what they may be given that they can share it with others. So. This week we saw the Olympics. I don't know if any of you watched. Did you see any sports? Yes. Did anybody watch the skateboarders? Wow. Okay. So maybe you don't have a skateboard and you would like to have a skateboard. So my suggestion would be instead of praying, Lord, you know, I'd really like to have a skateboard. I'd like to get really good at it so everyone could see how good I am. Instead of praying that, you can pray, Lord, I would love to have a skateboard. I've seen that on my street, there's not very many children who have skateboards, and I know of a few who would really like to play and have fun do using my skateboard if I get one. And then maybe God will show you how you can earn the money to get one. <laughs> okay, because it doesn't just, poof, happen, you know, like that, that you get one. Okay, or maybe it's like praying, Help me to believe that I can do really well in school. 
that I can be a testimony to other people, that I could have a reason to share what God has done for me. So, you know, God has asked us to have a mustard seed grain of faith. I think in some ways that makes me sad that he thinks that's all we're capable of, but he knows that we need something simple. He's not expecting us to have an elephant-sized grain of faith or even a mouse-sized grain of faith, just a mustard seed. That's all. So let's pray that God will show us what to ask for and how we can live to bring praise to his glory. So let's close with a little prayer, okay? Can we pray? Everybody, close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these truths from your word. Thank you for how really simp simple they can become, even for children to understand. And I pray for these children that you will bless them. I pray that they will truly encounter you, Lord, that they will come to know you, that you are their Lord and Savior. And we just praise you now in Jesus' name. And P.S., please hold the rain back. Thank you. Amen. So, thank you, Didi. Let's put all our seeds together and pray to the Lord. Um, normally, this is the time where um, Teen Street happened uh, in the past years before Corona. And, uh, at Teen Street, were gathered about 3,000 young people and then 1,000 helpers. And the morning sessions were um, Bible study and silent time. And in the afternoon, they had entertainment. And at the evening, there was worship. And when the worship came, they invited young people who wanted to have prayer for them to go to the back of the um, throne room and to ask for prayer. And so about 200 people were waiting for them there, ushers and uh, coaches and, and some leaders. And many young people came for prayer there. And you know, when 500 young people are there together and you have the worship at the same time in the same throne room and all these young people coming for prayer, it makes a lot of noise and you always almost couldn't hear them asking their requests. And at a certain point I realized that while for us it was a huge noise, for God at that time, he heard every prayer. And he knows by name every young man and every young girl who is there asking for prayer and he hears all these prayer all over the world in fact even at this time millions of people are praying to God and he hears their prayers very personally and that's what we do when we have this congregational prayer here as well God knows what is in your heart and the the inner voice you have when I, when we pray for for those who are sick and or those who have problems. We all know people by ourselves that we like to pray for. So God hears the, the main prayer, but he hears the prayers out of our hearts as well as we come to him as a congregation. And this is, yeah, this is all about who God is and who personal he is. And who he loves his, his community, but each of us individually. And he knows your neighbors, he knows your family who are not believers. So as we pray, please be free to, to, to bring names to God. He knows them all and he likes us to, to come to him in prayer. So far, let us um, bow our heads for him. Father, knowing you is um, 
makes all the difference in our lives, Father, and as things go well, as we are in difficulty, as we face things that we can't take in our own hands, that we can't result by ourselves, Father, we, we are allowed to come before your throne, and that's a magnificent thing. Father, to know that you are present here at this time, that you know us all, Father, that you are not only here, but all over the world. Because this world, Father, as we look around, we, we, we see this world losing control with the pandemic, with floods, with fires, with human humanitarian and disasters, people, so many people on the move, desperate. Father, this, we are losing control in the world, but you're not. So it's an absolute privilege, Father, to, to come before you in, in simple words. And you know the inner voice, you know us personally. So we thank you so much, Father, that we are allowed to appear before you. The curtain is gone. We have a direct access to the God who created the heavens and the earth and all life and everything is in your hands, Father. Even before you created the heavens and the earth, your plan never fails. How wonderful it is, Father, that you have opened our eyes to know you and that we have boldness and the freedom to come before your throne, Father. And Father, you know the desires of our hearts. You know the people we love and for whom we pray, Father. You know about those who are sick and going through illnesses. We know, Father, how you comfort. We know also that you can heal. We pray for them, Father. We bring them before your throne. We bring before your throne, Father, those who are um, having difficult decisions to make in their lives. When we think about Hatch and Kareen, Father, who at this moment don't know exactly which, which way to go, we bring them before your throne and many others are this also, Father, we bring them before your throne and we know that they are safe in your hands. We will pray for them, Father. We pray for the families. We pray for our marriages. We pray for our children. Father, we need wisdom and insight to educate our children, to, to help them to, to know you to help them, Father, to, to find their place in this world, to form them to the image of the Lord Christ. We pray for our teens, Father, how difficult their age is and the burdens they often have to carry, which are not meant for their shoulders. We, we especially pray for those, Father, in, in families who, who are in divorce or in dispute or in difficulty. We bring their parents before you, Father. We bring these children before you. We ask for your guidance over their lives, Father, your protection over them, your comfort in their lives, that they may know that they are loved, that there is a God who loves them more than anyone else, Father. We as parents, we, we are not perfect. And we know, Father, that your love exceeds all love possible. So we thank you so much, Father, that we may bring them before your throne. We thank you, Lord, that we may pray for wisdom and in for ourselves, Father, and purity in our hearts and in our minds to be good husbands or to be good wives, to be good parents to be the person you want us to be in this world, at the place you placed us in this world, the role that you gave us in society, the role that you gave us 
in our families. Father, we all have loved ones who don't know you. Sometimes it's a husband or a wife or children. Father, we, we have such a deep desire, Father, that they may know you, that they may come to faith. Father, therefore, we ask you, please open their eyes, their hearts for you. Help us, Father, to, to be your vessels it's in this world, Father, to testify, to, te to give testimony, Father, about who you are. But we often don't find the words, Father. We need you to guide us. We need you to give us the right words at the right time. It's so amazing, Father, to know that you are so near, that you're so close to us, that you know us perfectly and that you know what we, what we are able to do in your hands. For you, nothing is difficult, Father. And we want to be available. We want to know you better. We want to grow in our faith. We are so encouraged by Dylan, Father, who takes a gap year to know you better. But we ask this for all of us, Father, every day when we read in your words, when we pray, when we have fellowship, when we are in the connect groups, when we are in the study groups, Father, we, our desire is to know you better. When we are here this morning, Father, to hear Pastor Roland, we, we are here because we want to know you better. We want to come close to you. As Didi just talked, Father, that the little seeds may grow in our lives. And as we grow closer to you, we grow closer to one another as well. Father, we thank you so much that we also may pray for our missionaries all over the world. In difficult times, they are living through now. Father, we ask your blessing, your protection, your guidance over them. We thank you for those who are in vacation, Father, but please protect them. Protect all of us. And help us, Father, that we may make the difference in this world, in small things. You are still in the details of life. So we thank you every time, Father, that we are able to speak about you to anyone. And we ask you, Father, that these seeds may grow in their lives. This is a world who doesn't have you in picture anymore, Father. We pray for those who govern, for the rulers of this world, for the politicians, Father, for the people who are in charge. As we see, Father, that even as we put all our intellectuals together, Father, they cannot solve the problems of the world. Only you can. Only you. There's a God in heaven who is almighty. And Father, may I pray for our congregation. The words that Paul prayed, to the congregation of the Ephesians as well, Father. May I pray this in your name as a blessing over our congregation, Father, as I read these words in Ephesians 3, where Paul says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of your glorious riches, 
you may strengthen us with power to the Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to you, Lord, who are able to do infinitely more than all we ask or imagine, according to your power that is at work within us, to you, Lord, be glory in the Church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, I, I realize that some of you may be sitting in a wind tunnel, and uh, so if you'd just like to stand, maybe warm yourself up a little bit. If you see some eyes, or if you don't recognize some eyes, say hello, get to know that person. Just take a couple of seconds or so. That's good if we can take our, our seats now, please. Well, as you are taking your seats, uh, you may be here for the first time, and if you are, we're looking together at uh, the life of David, man of great faith, but also man of great failure. And don't we see that mix in our own lives? From now on till uh, through September, I'm going to be looking at his life a little bit more selectively. We've been working consecutively through the chapters, uh, but there's just so much there. Um, if you were here last week, you saw uh, with us how um, David had to be restrained by that wise woman, Abigail, and praise God for the wise women uh, that come across our path. And then in uh, chapter 26, we're not going to look at that. Uh, incredibly, the Lord enables David and one of his uh, generals to get right into the midst of the enemy camp. And uh, when David's general wants to uh, kill Saul, David, again, by the grace of God, restrains himself. And uh, the very last verse we read in chapter 26 uh, is this. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. It's a much shorter reading today. I'm going to read from chapter 27, uh, verse 1, through to verse 2 of chapter 28. But David thought to himself, one of these days I'll be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. So David and the 600 men with him left and went over to Achish, son of Mao, king of Gath. David and his men settled in Gath with Achish. Each man had his family with him, and David had his two wives, Ahonam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, the widow of that foolish man Nabal. And when Saul was told that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me in one of the country towns that I may live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? 
So on that day, Achish gave him Ziklag, and it's belonged to the kings of Judah ever since. David lived in Philistine territory a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. From ancient times, these people had lived in the land extending to Shur and Egypt. Whenever David attacked an area, he did not leave a man or woman alive, but took sheep and cattle, donkeys and camels and clothes. Then he returned to Achish. When Achish asked, where did you go raiding today? David would say, against the Negev of Judah, or against the Negev of Jeremiel, or against the Negev of the Kenites. He did not leave a man or woman alive to be brought to Gath, for he thought they might inform on us and say this is what David did. And such was his practice as long as he lived in Philistine territory. Achish trusted David and said to himself, he has become so obnoxious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant for life. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Achish said to David, you must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. David said, then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. Achish replied, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Lord, we come to you, and uh, in the words of the psalm that was read earlier on, we come because we have tasted and seen that you are good. And blessed is the man or woman. It was David, the man of your own heart, who wrote those words. Blessed is the man or woman who takes refuge in you. We see so much of ourselves in David, Lord. What an example to us of the life of faith. And what an example too beyond that of your incredible grace in the times that he failed. Help us to leave here with more love in our heart. Not so much for the examples in scripture. But for the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. You don't have to be a psychologist to know that positive talk has some value. Who of you are watching the Olympics? Right, a couple of us. And uh, how many times have you not heard? Uh, all you've got to do is believe in yourself. Once you've got a dream, then go for that dream and give it your all. In fact, uh, positive talk is uh, nothing new. When I was a child... Uh, I would read books uh, about a teddy bear called Winnie the Pooh. And Winnie the Pooh had this advice for children in a book called uh, Believe in Yourself. You are braver than you believe. You are stronger than you seem. And you are smarter than you think. Now, if we're honest, I think even as Christians, we'd all like to believe that. And sometimes we fool ourselves into believing that. David wanted to believe that of himself. And I like the honesty of uh, Betty. She was the wife of a soldier called John Bradley. John Bradley was awarded the Navy Cross. Uh, some of you may have seen that film, Flags of Our Fathers. Well, there's this uh, photograph of uh, these American soldiers raising up a flag. After a month-long battle in February 1945, where 21,000 Japanese soldiers were killed, along with 6,800 Americans. And Betty, uh, in a book, speaks of how on her first date, uh, John just spent eight minutes talking about what he'd been through, and he wanted to just move on. But he couldn't move on. He spent four years, she says, uh, weeping in his sleep and having flashbacks of the trauma that he went through. John Bradley, like any soldier, like us, is, was not as brave or as strong as he would like to think. And that's how it is in the Christian life. And that's how you see it in the life of David. Now, we're not where David is. We're not at war. But uh, 15 months down the line from COVID, I wonder if you have felt just a little exhausted and a little drained and full of questions, wondering how is this pandemic going to 
play out and will it play out and how am I going to be able to care in the way that I should for my children, my family in, in another nation, my relatives. And I, I'm so grateful for this chapter that um, some people have called a, a godless chapter in the sense that God is not mentioned anywhere in the chapter. It's like the book of Esther. No, no. But if you are feeling worn out, I think there's a lot here that we can learn and a lot of good counsel. When your troubles get thicker, and I wonder if you're feeling that your troubles are getting thicker, learn from this passage that you can lean fully on your true security. I find it very easy to judge David as I sit in my study up there in the comfort of my seat. But how would you feel if you were in his sandals? I wonder how, I wonder what you would say. I wonder how you would respond. What is clear is that David has what we might call, and they're common for us, doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, he has a, a fainting fit of faith. It's not the first one that he has, this man after God's own heart, and it's not the last. And I want you to notice that the first thing he does is that he turns to escape and not to trust. Verse 1, David thought to himself, one of these days I'm going to be destroyed. The best thing I can do, that's his self-talk, is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Now, it, this is an incredible turnabout, and to understand that I've got to take you to verse 10 of the previous chapter where David's general Abishai as they're standing over Saul says to him now is your chance you can kill him and everything will be over and your life will go on again and what a confession of faith David preaches to his own heart and he says as surely as the Lord lives the Lord himself will strike him or his time will come and he will die or go into battle and perish literally he will be swept away and now same God same promises David is too worn to go on in fact he uses the same word back in the previous chapter for himself verse 1 he says I will one day be swept away the best thing I can do is run ever felt like that another of his psalms David says Oh, if I had the wings of a dove. Beautiful thing to be a bird. I would fly away and be at rest. Well, David has some choice and he makes a decision. Anybody remember the last time he went into enemy territory and he went to Gath? He had to act like a madman so that people wouldn't be too suspicious of him until he could flee. But now David's got a big army, 600 men. And even in those days, kings were very happy to, pray, to pay for an army of mercenaries. And so David goes to Achish, the Philistine king, to negotiate a price. And he says to him, you let us make our home not too close to you. You let us make our home in Ziklag and we will fight for you. David was digging a hole for himself as ugly as the dilemma he was in. You know, I don't want to read into the Bible. I think we do that probably too often. We come to the Bible with our own minds made up. But it seems that by making no comment on, on David and what he was doing, there's a little bit of sympathy from the writer for David. Was, was any of that pleasing to God? No. But you know this in your own life. Pressure can make even those who love God do pretty fearful things. Pressure can make a Moses strike a rock in anger. Pressure can make an Elijah who knows God run for his life. Pressure can make a Jonah who knows what he ought to do go in the opposite direction. And pressure can make a Peter, even a Peter, deny the Lord Jesus Christ. So why not David? I wonder if uh, today you see yourself in David's sandals. I wonder if you 
think that the best thing I can do is to worry. And in fact, uh, we worry because we like to be in control. And I, I like what one biblical counselor says. It's very important to understand the central to worry. David was a worried man. Central to worry is the illusion that we can control things. So anxiety and control are two sides of the one coin. When we can't control something, and isn't God showing us that we can't control anything? When we can't control something, then we're inclined to worry. So he's thinking escape and not trust. But then, do you notice that his, his heart is talking to David and not David to his heart? But David thought to himself. Now, self-talk is nothing new in this week, brothers and sisters. I don't know what you've been saying to your heart. I don't know what you've been feeding your heart. But you and I have been talking to ourselves. We do it in a number of ways. My mind goes back to when I was uh, 16 years old. That's how old I was when I left home. Left a, a very small city, then called Salisbury, now called Harare. Went to the big city of London, had to find my way around. And there's certain things that my parents could do from far away with no technology to make sure I had some kind of support. But you know this. If you start a new chapter in a new country, in a, a new city, you're not going to survive. If you just keep listening to your heart, especially when you're lonely, rather than feeding your heart, what alone can sustain you. I remember many times, and I still do this in my own life, to my shame. When I say like David, I've got this. I've got this. But actually, I should be saying, Lord, you've got this. I should be saying, as David says in another psalm, Psalm 55 and verse 22, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be forsaken. And I just love it that sometimes, even when we're not talking to ourselves, God knows how to feed us with the word through the encouragement of somebody else. Charles Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers to ever live. But very few of us know that when he began his first year of ministry, he began it in the midst of a pandemic when there was a plague in London. And there wasn't a day when he didn't have to do a funeral for a loved one who had died. And it wore him out. And one day he was walking back to his church building. He was weary in his heart. And as he went past uh, the window of a shop, it was a shoemaker's shop, he saw a poster and it didn't look like an advertisement and it wasn't. It was a text of scripture and it was the one he needed. Psalm 91 verse 9, if you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you and no disaster will come near your tent. And he says, my faith appropriated that passage as my own. I felt secure. I felt refreshed. I went on with my visitation of the dying in a calm and peaceful spirit. There are pressures today that are trying to erode a vibrant faith. Make sure you are speaking the right things to your heart. When your troubles get thicker, lean fully on your true security. God has not changed, but then patiently learn the skill of wisdom. And here is something that, like most of us, David has to learn on the job. And David has to learn when the trouble gets thicker. I mean, he escapes into enemy territory, and at first there seems to be a good result. Uh, sometimes it's like that, isn't it? You make a decision, and at first you say, well, th this seems to be God's will. Uh, everything seems to be going so well. Of course, there's no mention of the cost. David is pleased with his schemes. And we read in verse 6 that Achish gave him Ziglag, a city. And the writer says, it has belonged to the kings of Judah ever since. I find that very telling. There was a time in the writer's day 
when people would think about David, the man after God's own heart, and they would say, uh, how is it that Ziglag, which is in the heart of enemy territory, how is it that it belongs to David's family? And there's a warning here, brothers and sisters, and I put it to my, my, myself too. What seems to work may not always be God's will. I, I think that uh, having your own bed in Ziglag is better than living in the caves. And being able to take your kids to town for Ziglag ice creams is better than having to eat bread on the run. And David feels very free. Uh, he feels very happy. He feels that he's been wise. But I don't think he has worked out the proverb. Proverbs 14 verse 12. There is a way that seems right to man. But in the end it leads to death. How shameful that because David was thinking only of himself. He was happy to be cruel to others. So that he might have a false sense of peace. Now before we too hard on uh, David. I, uh, I think this is a conflict that probably all of us wrestle with. At different stages of our lives. There's a desire to want to be true to who we are. When I was uh, a younger person. Mahatma Gandhi was an, an icon that many people looked up to. And, and he said happiness is when what you think and what you say and what you do are in harmony. But what when I am thinking that which God is not thinking, David gets it wrong when what he thinks becomes his standard. Now a word to younger folk who are with us. Timothy Keller blogged uh, a while back about a new book that was written tracking the beliefs of young adults aged from 18 to 23. And the author of that book relates how he asked uh, those he interviewed if their moral convictions, and some of them had very strong moral convictions, were just their subjective feelings because they felt it was right, or whether it was true to reality. Was there a higher authority? Why are you living in the way you are? And they really were, were living by their own mantra. And it's the same mantra that's pumped to us every day by the media, right? Do what you like. Be true to who you are because you've only yourself to answer for. Listen, listen. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to man, but it leads to more darkness. Those of you who are younger, one day, God willing, you're going to be married. How can you have a stable marriage when you're basing it on who you are and what you want? How would you be able to trust your mate or anyone else? Do you even know who you really are or who you're going to be in a week from now or in a month from now? And I commend to you Jesus Christ, the greater son of David, however old or young you are, who says, I am the light of of the world. Base your life on me. He who is following me will not walk in the darkness, but he will have the light of life. You see, David shows us that what looks like success can be a bubble that pops. Why? Because what seems easy is sometimes a false savior. You know, deceit can continue for so long. Can you see Akish? The time comes when Akish says, Okay, David, now the real battle is on. Now I want you to join us. And David joins him in a major assault, is about to join him in a major assault on his own people. And uh, in chapter 28 and verse 2, he says, you and your men are going to accompany me. And David has a dilemma because deep down he knows, I cannot fight my own people, the very ones over whom I will rule. But he's surely thinking, if I don't join in, then 
the game will be over. Can I, can I say something? Often in life, when we come to a crisis of faith, it doesn't begin with something dramatic, like a damn wall that bursts. But it begins, and you see it with David, it begins with the drip, drip, drip of a weary heart and an eagerness to go the easy route and the comfort of a false security in, in, in another king. And if David isn't going to be saved out of that, how will he ever be the man after God's own heart? I know this is just part of David's story, but... Um, I think it's a parable of how we are tempted to see life. Uh, my youngest brother, I have four brothers. My youngest brother, he is, uh, he's the joker in the family. And in the week, I, I WhatsApped him and said, Well, Roger, how can I be praying for you? And he came back to me. He's not a believer. And he said, uh, The lottery is 105 million rand. This is in South Africa this week. Maybe you could put in a good word for that. We laugh at those things. But will you be honest? Will you be honest with yourself today? Have you ever thought yourself thinking, if only I had this, or if only these people were better, or if I had another job, or if I had a better boss, if I had the easier way, wouldn't I be more blessed? It's not true to the Bible. And it's not even true to life. Brothers and sisters, what seems so easily to be a good savior is a false savior. That is why we cannot trust in riches or in even good governments or even in the best leadership because they will fail us. That is why we can alone trust in the treasure that really matters. May God help us to get rid of the if onlys in our lives, right? If only my husband would change. If only my wife would change. If only that situation would change. Look what you've done, Lord. Look where we are. If only we didn't have COVID and the implications, our lives would be easier. The church life we knew would once be back. We could focus on kingdom matters. And while seeking to look for the easy way out, listen, while looking for the easy way out, we miss the godly way forward and the lessons that God is teaching. That's why the Bible says, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Let me end with this. When your troubles get thicker, lean fully on your true security. Patiently learn the skill of wisdom and then lose the idolatry of saying, I've got this. I think that's the main point of this passage. That was the problem for David. I've got this. I can control it. And the passage that we've read uh, leaves us hanging a little bit. Very next chapter you read about Saul who's entirely lost the word of God and he wants a witch to raise the prophet Samuel from the dead. But the thing is, here is David. He's still has some of the word and it's still guiding him and yet the man anointed to be king says to the enemy king i'm with you in this battle it's ugly behavior and you kind of attempted to think god have you made a mistake have you made a mistake in calling this man uh, one of the reasons i love the bible is that it's just so realistic you will not find another book in the world that is as realistic about your heart than the Word of God. We, we might now be angry with David. We want to be able to teach our kids, don't we? Be like David, be like Daniel, be like Ruth, be like Esther. Or maybe you feel a bit sorry for David. <laughs> Lord, uh, he's been anointed, but now he's being hounded. And one of the reasons we love David is because we, we have a desire for a hero, a hero who's going to get it right and who's going to get it right all the time. Hold on. And listen very carefully. Do you ever think that 
Perhaps the Bible was written not to elevate David, but to correct you and to correct me. We want our heroes. Man, I love to watch the Olympics. <laughs> I've got my heroes. We want those to be deep down what we are not, what we would aspire to be and do. We want those who will scale the heights and to show us what is right. We want those who can teach us to be courageous. And do you see that not even David could say, I've got this. In fact, when he thinks he's got this, he's already strayed in his heart. And when his double-mindedness is exposed, we, we say, boy, he's just like us. Flesh and blood. Lord, we need a hero. That hero can't be David. And here's another reason to love the Bible. Lo love the Bible because it doesn't cover over the cracks. You know, if it was up to me, I would want to rewrite the passage. I would want the passage to say, Saul, he was all dark and all evil on the inside. And I'd want to say, David, he was all clean and all good. But because he wasn't, that's why we need, that's why you need Jesus Christ. You know, it doesn't matter who you are today or what you think you've done. What medals of achievement you think you have in your life. It doesn't matter how much you compare yourself to others or how self-righteous you think you are because you haven't committed the sin that they've committed. The Bible just simply says, here's the truth. All of us, all of us have sinned. All of us. The best of heroes have fallen short of the glory of God. But David is the proof that all are justified by His grace through the redemption that came, not by David, but by Jesus Christ, which brings us to the heart of the gospel. It is not about God saying you're not quite so bad. It is not about God saying, well, you've just made silver or bronze and that's good enough. It is about God purposing to send His Son through the line of David to save us from sin and hell. Two questions. Two questions as I close today. And my first question, uh, I don't know the heart of everybody who's here. These days I'm battling to recognize everybody with the masks and so on. And it's great to see some visitors amongst us. The first question to you, if you are thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a perfect person, but I'm impressed with Jesus. Is that enough? Many years ago, a pastor was closing a service, and as soon as he closed the service, somebody came to him and said, I don't like the way you spoke about the cross. Instead of emphasizing the death of Jesus, it's better to preach Jesus as our teacher and example. And uh, the preacher said, well, if I presented uh, Jesus to you in that way, would you be willing to follow him? I would, the person said. All right, he said, let's take the first step. step. Jesus did no sin. Can you claim that for yourself? Let's be honest, nobody can. Listen to me. Listen to me. On the last day, it will... It will not do you any good to say, I wasn't perfect. I was better than that relative. And I like the example of Jesus. There will be many on the last day who admired Jesus, who meant Him no harm. They never followed Him because they believed that they got this. They had what it takes. And you're not following Jesus unless you can say, as we're going to sing, Jesus is my joy. He's my righteousness. He's my freedom. He's my steadfast love. He's my deep and boundless peace. That means that you haven't got this. But Jesus has. And the second question to you who say, even if you've walked with the Lord, doesn't matter how many books you've read or how many times you've read through the Bible, I put the same warning to myself. Never ever think that you are stronger than you are. 
godlier men and women than us who've done great feats for the Lord have failed because they said, I've got this. And in the end, they brought disgrace on the name of Jesus and their families. Remember that when God works with us, He's not working with the best clay. Please remember that. He's working with sinful, sinful clay. As long as we say we've got this, we'll never be able to understand the Bible. We'll never be able to tremble in the right way before this God. We'll never truly be able to delight in Him as we should. And we want to delight in Him. Join with me as we pray. Lord, we confess that we find it very easy when we read the Bible to say, well, this could apply to this person or that situation. And just because of the nature of who we are and the self-deceit that's often in our own hearts, we see it in the man after your own heart, David. It's a lot more difficult to apply it to our own hearts. And yet we don't want the evil one to snatch away the word. Nothing impacts our lives more than how we think about you. Not how we think necessarily about David, but how we think about you. And the more we see your beauty, uh, Jesus, the more we see your love, and the more we see your perfection, the more compelled we are to adore and serve you. Lord, please keep us in this week from limited faith and behavior that will dishonest you, dishonor you. Keep Jesus before our eyes and our minds. Grow your joy in our lives, that it may topple all our fears, that it may fuel our faith, that we may walk humbly with you. And we'll be careful to give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give He is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this
And it is to you, our Lord, that we give the glory for sending Jesus to be our righteousness, our joy, our freedom, our assurance of your steadfast love, even when, as David, we fail, and our deep and boundless peace. Send us into this world, we pray, to be channels of blessing for the name and the glory of Jesus alone. Amen. Amen. Please be seated and uh, not going to keep you that much uh, longer. But uh, we're delighted that uh, some people have expressed the desire to be baptized. So God willing, in uh, first Sunday in uh, September, we'll have a baptismal service. There are at least who could like to be baptized. And you are uh, very welcome to speak to me or any of the elders. If you'd like to be baptized, we'd love to meet with you. Take that first step of obedience in the Christian life after we have come to faith. And then, uh, so glad that Didi in her children's talk mentioned uh, the VBS, which began all those years ago in the 80s. And faithfully, every year, it's been a highlight. And there's no reason why this year it won't be a highlight as well. Continue to pray for that. On the back page of your bulletin, you'll see, if you look under Friday, uh, you're saying, well, look, I'm praying, but maybe I'd, I'd like to be involved a bit more. You can't be involved in the week. Well, you can be involved Friday evening, 7.30. We need folk to just assist with some crafts. I've done it before. I'm not good with my hands, but some, some cutting, some pasting, 7.30 on Friday evening. And uh, uh, we also need some hands to help us move some, some chairs. Uh, so please take note of that. And then last week uh, I uh, mentioned to you, in fact, we sang the benediction. We gave glory to God for uh, being able in difficult days to uh, be exactly where we want to be in terms of the giving. God has been so gracious to us. Some of you are new to the church. You can find details for giving if you'd like to, to do that in terms of extending God's kingdom. They're uh, at the back uh, page of uh, the bulletin. I have been pushing the book table. And uh, it's so wonderful that uh, we have had uh, books available, uh, books on maturity by Sinclair Ferguson. I think there's just one or two left. I highly commend that excellent book to you. And then that uh, very helpful book, if you have friends or relatives who have been bereaved, uh, Grief, uh, a wonderful little booklet uh, to give to anyone who uh, is, is grieving um, uh, by Paul Tripp. And then How to Enjoy Your Bible by John Blanchard. Uh, but I do want to commend to you uh, the greatest book of all, which is uh, the Word of God. And sometimes people, uh, a number of people have said to me, uh, can you commend a study Bible? There are just so many study Bibles to choose from. Uh, I, I heartily commend the English uh, study version, study Bible. Now, this is worth it just uh, for uh, the back page or so of, of articles on all kinds of issues, uh, and especially the one on biblical ethics. So uh, this is a lovely personal one. Uh, some of us still do read the printed page, and it's, it's good to do that as well. So uh, this goes for a very good price, ESV Study Bible, and uh, Jan has other uh, Bibles as well. Now, I believe, uh, there's at least one birthday, and a very special birthday. I won't mention the number, because I'm told not to do that with ladies. Uh, Brent, are you here? We'd like to stand. Brent Inwood? I thought Brenda, Brenda, you are an example. You're not just 
a, a cancer survivor. You're a cancer victorious overcomer. And you are walking in Terfuren. Right? You started to walk again in Terfuren. Can we sing happy birthday to, uh, to Brenda? We love you in the Lord and we're going to sing happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Brenda. Happy birthday to you. And and Brenda, may your fortieth year be as good as your thirtieth year. <laughs> And then uh, just to say welcome to visitors, we have a little um, uh, booklet we'd love to give you and some information about our church. So if, you, if you're here for the first time and you uh, don't feel too shy just to raise your hand, w somebody will uh, uh, come to give that t uh, to you. And maybe you could just tell us your name and where you're from. Uh, somebody with a mic, please. Thank you. Right over there. Would you mind, sir? Just if you could stand up, please. Thank you. Yeah, that makes it easier to see. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Osuya Sama. I'm from Ghana. And Brother Peter invites me here. Yeah. Welcome amongst us. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm David, and we're from South Africa. Well, also uh, on the right side, would you mind standing, please, just so they see you more easily with the mic? Thank you. Hi, I'm Midir. I'm from Albania. And Mark is uh, the nephew of my wife, Donica. We are here just for a week, yes, for holidays. But we really enjoy the meeting. Welcome amongst us. Have we covered everybody? All right, let's stand together and uh, sing the benediction. Bless you and have a wonderful week in the Lord.